Good morning everybody and welcome to City Church Swansea at Home. My name is Alice, this is my mum Caroline and we're here to welcome you today. I'm not sure what type of week you've had. Maybe you have gone back to work after several months off. Maybe you are still shielding or unsure whether you should be going out now or not. Maybe you've worked all the way through. Maybe you're a student um, that's waiting for a university place. But just for this morning, let's lay all that down. Let's come with really expectant hearts to see what God's going to do and how God's going to speak to us this morning. We're going to pray and then we're going to hand over to Phil, who's going to lead us in our worship. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for who you are and what you do, how you provide for us and how you guide us. Holy Spirit, we ask you to come and meet with every single person watching and listening here this morning. Meet us where we are, Father God. We come to honour you and we come to worship you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen.
Thanks, Phil. I love what Nehemiah says about the joy of the Lord being our strength. And that is something that I have personally clung on to, especially during lockdown. We're going to hand over to Nicole now, who's going to share a psalm with us. And then we're going to hand back to Phil to continue with our worship. Good morning, church. This is Nicole. And today I'm going to be reading you a psalm. Um, but before I get into it, I just really want to encourage you to really listen to this and allow God to speak to you through it. This is one of my favourite psalms because it always reminds me that God is in constant pursuit of me and that he loves me and that no matter what walk of life I'm in right now, that God is always right next to me. And so I'm going to be reading from Psalm 139. So if you have your Bibles or your tablets or your phone, um, or if you just want to listen, then follow me as I read this psalm. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my laying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. And so I just want to encourage you with that psalm today, that no matter where you are in life, if you find yourself in light or darkness, that God is with you that he is walking alongside you, that he'll never let go of you, that he is working in your life, that he is for you. And so I just wanna pray into this psalm and pray over you guys today. And so, Father, I just thank you that you are a God who is constantly in pursuit of us. I thank you that you are always close, that you never let us go, you never forsake us that you want relationship with us. I just pray, Father, today, I don't know where people are at in their lives, whether they feel close to you or far, but Lord, I just pray right now that we will be able to experience your presence so intimately and so closely. I thank you, God, that you are a loving Father. And I just pray that as we go about this service, that we will be able to hear from you I thank you, Father, for everything that you've done and everything of who you are. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Morning everyone. We're continuing our journey through the New Testament book of Philippians in a series called Light in Lockdown. Now we've looked over the past couple of weeks how Paul, who himself was in lockdown, who wrote the book, made choices in order to get through his lockdown well. And I know for many of us, we have been making some good choices over this time in lockdown. We've made the choice of making the most of family time. We've sorted the garden. We've done those projects around the house that have needed to be done. We've exercised. On a spiritual note, we probably had some more time in prayer and Bible reading than usual. So we've made the most of our time. But today we're looking at how Paul made a decision to pursue Christ above everything else. I'm sure many of us have task lists. I am personally someone that likes to work towards a, a task list. I see those priorities and I head towards them. That is the way I work. And for Paul, he had a key priority. Above everything else, he wanted to know Christ. He wanted to pursue Christ. And we read about that from Philippians 3 verses 4 to 11. So let's turn there now. Paul says then, I could have confidence in my own effort if anyone could. Indeed, if others have reason for confidence in their own efforts, I have even more. I was circumcised when I was eight days old. I am a pure-blooded citizen of Israel and a member of the tribe of Benjamin, a real Hebrew if ever there was one. I was a member of the Pharisees who demanded the strictest obedience to the Jewish law. I was so zealous that I harshly persecuted the church and as for righteousness, I obeyed the law without fault. I once thought these things were valuable but now I consider them absolutely worthless because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, Paul says, I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage so that I could gain Christ and become one with him. I no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law. Rather, I become righteous through faith in Christ. For God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith. He goes on to say, I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death, so that one way or another, I will experience the resurrection from the dead. In the 1730s in England, a young man named George Whitefield was desperately pursuing God. As a student at Oxford, he was part of the Holy Club along with John and Charles Wesley. And the members of that club rose early every day for lengthy devotions. They disciplined themselves not to waste a minute of the day. They wrote a diary at the end of each day and within that night they would examine themselves and condemn themselves for any fault that took place during that day. They fasted each Wednesday and Friday and set aside Saturday as a Sabbath to prepare for Sunday. On Sunday they would take communion together and they would try to persuade others to come to church and to stop doing evil. They visited prisons and gave money to help the inmates and their families during that difficult time. But Whitefield nearly ruined his health by all this activity. For seven weeks he was sick in bed, confessing his sin and spending hours praying and reading his Greek New Testament. Yet by his own admission, he realised that he wasn't saved. In all this activity, he was hoping that it was actually the activity that was going to save him. But finally, he surrendered his life to Christ. He started 
to know Christ as his saviour. And he says that the burden of his sins and the religion was lifted and he was filled with joy. And he went on to become a great evangelist used by God in the first great awakening. Thankfully for you and I, we do not have to go through the agony that George Whitefield went through. But we must all come to that same place where in our pursuit of God, we throw overboard all our trust in good work, all our trust in activity and simply cling to the Lord Jesus Christ as our hope and as our salvation. And Paul, who we've read about, was on a similar journey, really, to, to George Whitefield in his pursuit of Christ. He came to a place where he let go of pride and activity in exchange for an encounter with Christ. And this is the theme of the passage that we've read. It's coming to that place, along with Paul, along with George Whitefield, where we give up our good works, where we give up our religion, where we give up codes of conduct in order to know Christ as our saviour. In Acts 9, we read about how Paul became a Christian and man, it was amazing. It was on the Damascus road that he encountered Jesus. And it's on that road that he came to realise that all that he was counting on was completely and utterly worthless. And as it was highlighted in our reading, Paul took all those things that he was wrongly counting on and simply threw them in the bin. I don't know about you, but with my phone, I have a constant challenge with a lack of storage. I'm using my phone now to uh, to film this this sermon, this uh, this talk with you. And, you know, there's a challenge of space within my phone and I need to keep on binning the unwanted apps, photos, videos, the apps that are just slowing my phone down. I have to get rid of them in order to keep it running, in order to keep it active, and in order to pursue Christ, in order to know him, Paul, he had to get rid of those unwanted apps in his life. And maybe we need to do the same too on our phones, but, but more importantly, in life. What apps do we need to get rid of? What is slowing us down today? You know, sometimes there are phone apps that we have for a season. As our children were younger or when our children were younger, we had some apps on the phone that they would use to, to play, to keep them busy. And there comes a time where some of those apps that we've had in our lives for the season, we simply need to get rid of. And I want to encourage you to think about this morning. What do you need to get rid of in order to pursue Christ, in order to know Christ? The first thing that Paul put in the bin were his rituals. Paul had been circumcised as a child eight days after his birth. And Jewish teaching highlighted that you had to be circumcised in order to be saved. But Paul realised that no one can put their confidence in any ritual to earn favour with God. Secondly, he put in the bin his status. He was a citizen of the covenant nation of Israel. He was from the tribe of Benjamin, in whose territory was the holy city, Jerusalem. This tribe was the first tribe that provided the first king of Israel. So, you know, this status meant a lot. Paul was a Hebrew of Hebrews. He was an elite in the Jewish faith. But Paul realised that we are all one in Christ. Whatever our race, whatever our background, we stand before Christ as one nation, as one people. Thirdly, Paul put in the bin religion. Paul was previously a Pharisee, the strictest sect of Judaism, and they sought to obey the law in the most extreme ways. And also as a Pharisee, 
He was zealous to see the persecution of Christians. But Paul came to realise in Acts 9 on that Damascus road, religion is empty. It's worthless. Fourthly, Paul put in the bin his pride, probably the most challenging one, the biggest one of all, but he put his pride in the bin. For Paul, before coming to faith in Christ, life had been about the outward appearance, showing everyone how we obeyed the law. It was all an act. And Paul realised he had to get rid of that in order to know life in Christ. He gave it up. God doesn't want us to act. God doesn't want us to put on an outward appearance. Paul, he realised that in sorting out and getting rid of those apps, he could pursue Jesus. He could know Jesus fully. He says in verse 7, I once thought these things were valuable. But now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. He says, for his sake, I have discarded everything else. I've got rid of those apps. I counted all garbage. It's in the bin so that I can gain Christ and become one with him. So in coming to Christ for salvation, Paul got rid of the things that he didn't need anymore. And he also suffered loss. He was disinherited by his relatives. He was disowned by his friends. He was persecuted by countrymen. He had been beaten. He had been flogged, even left for dead. He gave up everything to know Christ. And today I'm in awe of those in our church family who have left everything to know Christ. I think of brothers and sisters that have fled countries in order to know Christ fully. I'm in awe of you. I'm amazed by what you have done. The pursuit of Christ meant so much to Paul. And within this passage, we see. Firstly, he gained the ability to know Christ. In verse 10, Paul says, I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. Paul had a personal relationship with Jesus. In school, one of the few subjects that I enjoyed was history. I had a great history teacher, Mr. James. And you'll know that within those lessons, we learn about key influential people down through the ages, but we never have that relationship with those people. I'm thankful for my relationship with my wife, family and friends, but there is nothing greater than knowing Jesus. Everything flows from my relationship with him. And I want to challenge us all to pursue Jesus. And in our pursuit, let's ask God to speak to us. Let's share with him in prayer. This is how we develop our friendship with him and get to know him, thinking like he thinks and having his heart for our families, our friends, our community. Before Paul was saved, he simply followed a set of rules. Now, Paul had a relationship. He had a friend in Jesus. Jesus was his constant companion, even in lockdown. And I want to encourage us today that Jesus is our constant companion. He is with you. I'm so thankful that over the years that Christ's presence has been there in my life. With his strength, I have been able to delete those unwanted apps. I've been able to bin some stuff. And I'm thankful for that. And I'm thankful for being able to know him greater. Secondly, the gain for Paul was this. He was found in Christ. He was positioned in Christ. And I want to encourage us today that we are not only found in Christ, but we are positioned. We are seated with him. Paul says, I no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law 
Rather, I become righteous through faith in Christ. When God looks at his children, when he looks at you and me, he sees Christ. And the same should be true when people look at us, they should see Christ. When Paul trusted Christ, he lost his self-righteousness, the pride, that app of pride, it was binned and he gained the righteousness of Jesus. Paul said it like this in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21, for our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Thirdly, Paul's gain was that he experienced Christ's power. And we read that in verse 10 again. He says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Paul received a power in Christ that enabled him to change. And I just want to encourage you today that within Christ we have a power that enables us to change. If you are struggling with a habit, with an addiction, whatever it may be, Christ gives us the power to change. And that's what happened with Paul. Christ went to work in Paul's life, transforming him into a completely new person. Think about scripture, think about Peter in the Gospels. He was changed by Christ's resurrection power. Before Jesus went to Gethsemane, Peter denied Christ, didn't he, by the fire. And he went out from that place, Peter, and he wept bitterly because he felt a complete and utter failure. But when Jesus rose from the dead, Peter was a changed man. He received that resurrection power that he needed to change. Peter became bold. And, you know, he became bold in his faith and he preached a powerful sermon at Pentecost. And Jesus says to Peter in Matthew 16, verse 18, that it is on you, Peter, I will build my church. In Christ, we receive power to change. Sometimes that work of Christ changing us is a painful work. Sometimes we have to suffer for Christ and Paul suffered for Christ. But Paul knew it was a privilege to go through what he went through for the sake of knowing Jesus. He goes on to say in verse 11 that it's by any means possible that I may attain resurrection from the dead. Paul's pursuit was Christ, living in the fullness of of his resurrection power and that is what God wants for you and I today he wants to he wants us to live in the fullness of Christ's resurrection power Paul's pursuit of Christ brought him so much joy and I know you know as well there is so much joy in serving and living for Jesus Paul saw that what he had gained in Christ was far more than what he had lost. In comparison to Christ, all those human achievements, all those unwanted apps, they were completely and utterly rubbish. He was no longer thinking about himself, but he thought about Christ and he wanted to share that love for others. Paul, in lockdown, reflected on life from a heavenly perspective and I want to encourage us let's have the right perspective I want to remind us today that Christ is our ultimate treasure he is everything and Christ can never be taken from us and his value will never decline so let your joy today be found in Christ I want to encourage us as I close, together, let's deal with those unwanted apps in our lives. Let's bin them so that we can know Christ in all his fullness. I pray that you will grow in your 
knowledge of Christ. I pray that you will know the reality of your positioning in Christ. Again, I repeat in Ephesians 2 verse 6, it says there, And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms. And I pray that you will know Christ's resurrection power in your life. He is our ultimate treasure. And I pray that you will know the reality of that in Jesus' name. Amen.
everyone, this is Bami. As we come to this time of sharing communion together, I just want to share a little reflection of mine that I wrote a few days ago, because I suppose it's a way that I don't look at it that often. So from time to time, when I'm reading the scriptures, I would really, really go into um, putting myself, trying to visualize what was going on. So I'm just going to read from my notes from the reflection I wrote. So, so basically, apart from being a time for us to pause and reflect, I just thought that it's important for us not to take for granted the inheritance that we have in God through Christ. And I believe that this is an opportunity to be filled with deep gratitude for this most precious sacrifice. Because here was the thing. Jesus was at that table. He already knew the trial. He already knew the great sorrow that was ahead of him. He already knew that one of the people, one of his closest friends, one of those whose feet he washed, was going to betray him. And yet, he still did it anyway. He still went ahead, you know. And some of these verses in, Gets in the Garden of Gethsemane would put into perspective the struggle, the sorrow that he had. Because at the time Jesus was doing this, he was still, yes, he was God, but he was also fully human. And all I could think of when I was reflecting on what must have gone through his mind was that what an amazing sacrifice, what love, what I cannot even begin to describe in words how powerful that was. So when he said in Luke 22, 19 to 20, and I'm going to read, he says, um, just bear with me. And he took the bread, gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then he says, in the same way, after the supper, he took the cup and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood poured out for you. So I just want to encourage us to be filled with gratitude, deep gratitude for this most precious sacrifice, even as we do this. So if you grab your bread, and the, the bread that signifies his body broken for us. And he said we should do this in remembrance of him. And also let's get our cup. And this is to represent the wine. This is to represent his blood shed for us. And he also said we should do this in remembrance of him. As we come to the end of this time of communion, the hymn that comes to mind for me is how deep the Father's love for us, how vast, beyond all measure, that he, that our Lord Jesus will do this for us. So I pray that in deep gratitude, but also in deep reflection as well, that we will not take for granted this most precious sacrifice. God bless you. Just to remind you that we have a full week of activities for the whole family online, just check out City Church Swansea on our social media platforms for more information. Yeah, what a special morning and thank you all for joining us. Be safe, have a great week. Remember the joy of the Lord is our strength. See you next week.